Hi, Jeanette. Yeah, hi, hi Dylan. <laughs> um, give me a quick sound check real quick. Okay, well, how does this sound? That does sound, this sound okay? That sounds pretty good. Is that going to be your, your normal Yeah, that's tone? pretty much, yeah, that's pretty much it. Outstanding. Cool. So, um, first, if you want to just mm -hmm. introduce yourself, my name is Jeanette yeah. McKinley, maybe mm -hmm. like what you're... Maybe what you do. I mean, or what did I last night? I do, I mean, do you want me to even bring NYC can up, or do is that going to be like <clears throat> beside I, the point? If depending on how you're going to use I mean, this. The other thing is that the movie's yeah. not going to be out till September, right. and by that so point, it's it'll dated. Probably, it'll yes. probably be dated by then. Yeah. So um, I guess my Just, name is Jeanette McKinley. Yeah, um, keep. If you have a profession, <laughs> per uh -huh, se. Right. Um, and then from there we'll. I'm going to say I'm an artist. That works. Nobody okay. will dispute that. <laughs> there you go. Cool. So we'll start with uh, the formal introduction. Right. Cool. We're good. Hi, Dylan. I'm Jeanette McKinley. I'm and sorry. Do I look at you or do I look at the You're camera? You're going to look at me, but actually just my name is Jeanette McKinley. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Don't say your name at all. Yeah. yeah okay. My name is Jeanette McKinley. I was a resident of Lower Manhattan living directly across the street from the World Trade Center on September 11th. I had been living there for four years. I loved living there. When I think back about it, it's really the time of my life. And, um, and there was always something going on. It was just a buzz of energy. And so on September 11th, I was uh, able to, I was writing emails. I was sitting at my computer. Boom. I could immediately see the flames. I was close enough that I could literally just turn my head and there it was with the building burning. The first words out of my mouth at the time was, it's a bomb, a bomb has gone off. I was, that was the, my intuition was that it was a bomb. That was the first thing I said. And then as, as the day unfolded, it was first reported as a small, aircraft and you just kind of didn't think it was that serious and as things unfolded a second plane went in and for some reason that even seemed logical to me that if it was going to be a terrorist attack that it was going to be an all-out terrorist attack but once the second plane went in and it really pretty much sealed it that this was a, a, a very big thing uh, I was with my friend Jim Lecce. We watched everything out the window. He was fixated, taking photographs, and uh, whenever I mentioned leaving, he never wanted to leave. He said to me, this is history. Don't you realize we are watching history happen? We're, you know, we're part of history. Why would we leave? We would, I don't want to watch this on TV. I'm, you know, I'm not going anywhere. So I really wasn't going to leave him and become separated. And so I was trying to stay calm. So I packed up my bag. And, but um, I was working on flowers in the kitchen, just trying to hold on to normalcy. For me, it was holding on to normalcy, just trying to stay calm. I didn't really want to leave either, because when you looked outside, I was more scared of being trampled to death because people were running out of the building screaming, crowds of people screaming. And I thought, where are all these people going? If we go outside, then I'm in the middle of a panicked crowd. And that's not a place you really want to be either. And debris was falling, and fire engines were coming. It was filled with sirens. So there's really no clear answer on, well, go, if you go outside, you're part of this. We're at home. Just relax. But about two or three times I went over to the window and uh, I didn't really want to watch it. My friend Jim was fixated on it. It just made me too nervous to watch everything. And, uh, but I said to him about three times, do you think those towers are going to explode? He go, what are you talking about? Explode? Where do you, what, where, you know, why are you, no, don't be ridiculous. They're not going to explode. We're going to be here all day. They are going to, you know, this is going to be burning a long time. Just, we might as well just relax because we're going to be here all day. This is an all day thing. So don't even, but, and then I would, actually I did it about two or three times. I just said, well, I just have the feeling they're going to explode. And he thought, you're ridiculous. Anyway, just, you're ridiculous. And okay. So, um. I was in the kitchen, I was in my kitchen, I had flowers in my hand, working on my flower arrangements. 
to stay calm. It's working on the Japanese flower arranging that I study as a way I center myself and stay calm. So I was working on Ikebana in the kitchen. Jim was fixated at the window and the building starts coming down and uh, our windows blew in. He came running across the apartment get out of here, the building is coming down. Well, it sounded like it was coming down on us, just that we were going to be crushed. Uh, and then it was shaking so hard. We were over by our door. We were just hanging on to each other because the, the, the vibration of, of the towers coming down. Well, at the one, and also at that time, that cloud, that the, there was a debris cloud created by the um, when the tower two fell, it created a debris cloud which became part of our life because it just burst in our window at 50 miles an hour. That whole cloud just came poof, bursting in and um, we didn't think that we were going to be able to get out of the building because we were breathing in so much of the dust and when we were walking out, going down the hallway. There was so much dust, you couldn't breathe because every time you breathed, you just took dust in. And being under that cloud, was uh, it blocked out all of the light. So it was actually a very terrifying place to be in the dark, breathing this dust. And like really not really wondering, it's like, well, don't breathe, you know, breathe, don't breathe, what, you know, what am I gonna do? And we got down, we went to our front door, which was completely covered with debris, just absolutely blocked. We would have never gotten out the front of our building. But there was a back entrance down an alleyway. So we went to the back entrance, and when we got back there, the cloud was still roaring. I mean, it took a long time before it really calmed down, and there were like de debris and dust and steel beams, everything literally just flying and in front of us and um, I think that was probably the worst moment because you just didn't know like I'm in the middle of a hurricane I'm in a tornado or where I'm in the middle of like what am I even in the middle of what what am I even watching you had no idea what was going on so uh, we went back up to our apartment at that point our dust was just coming in through all the cracks under the door uh, Jim who immediately said we need to get wet towels. So we ended up going back up into our apartment and uh, soaking towels and then just wrapping them completely around our heads. And so by the time you know we did that, then when we, we went back to the back entrance and when we stepped out, um, we thought we were the only people alive because at that point it was early enough that if people had been outside, they were killed. They were really killed by that debris. And if they, so they were, if they were outside, they were dead. And then if they were inside, they were inside. Our windows had broken, so it was impossible for us to stay breathing in the dust. But if people were inside where their windows hadn't been broken, they were staying inside. So we didn't see anybody for over a minute at least, just you know, we were just looking at each other, you know, are we the only people alive here? You know, or just what? I don't know. Is And there were shoes everywhere. That was one of the things we looked at each other and because everybody's, somehow everybody's shoes flew out and there were cell phones and briefcases. So it was a pretty um, welcome to hell. Sometimes I think I should talk about my story as from hell and hell and back because that's what it was, just like step into hell. But um, we were looking, we were trying to get shelter. We walked south because, of, and then we started seeing a few more people. When we were like maybe like three or four blocks away, there was a policeman in front of a restaurant, and he said we had to come in. It was. TGIF Fridays. He said, you have to go down to the basement because the second tower is going to collapse any minute. And when it collapses, there's going to be 
stuff everywhere. You need to go down to the basement. So my friend Jim didn't want to go to the basement, um, but they really kind of made us. You know, the police were there, go to the basement. And that was also pretty terrifying. They kept us in the basement with no news at all for maybe about an hour. So we were actually in the basement with maybe 20 or 30 other people because they had put everybody in the basement of this restaurant. And other than maybe one woman crying, nobody was even saying a word. Nobody, nobody knew what was going to happen to them and they weren't even saying a word. We were just like, and so you really just had your imagination. I was just wondering, one of the things that ironically went through my mind was, whatever they do, I hope they don't torture me. I really, you felt like, I felt like I was going to be a prisoner of war. That you just almost expected when we came up that the be tanks on the ground. Or the thing that I was most scared of was that all of lower Manhattan was going to somehow catch fire. That, you know, I hadn't actually seen how the tower fell. So I, even though the dust was there, I still somehow had a vision of it falling over. It falls. And then I thought, does this mean this is going to start some tremendous fire and we're going to be trapped? You know, this is my, this is my tomb. I'm now looking at, you know, this is it. I'm not going to ever come out of this basement. So that was also pretty stressful, just, just not knowing, just praying to God to save us, you know, dear God, save us. And... Um, Anyway, ultimately they let us out. We, there, the police had evacuation routes uh, set up by that time. They wanted us to go over to Staten Island or Brooklyn Bridge, walk over or take the boat over. Well, we were really living in Manhattan. Everybody we knew lived in Manhattan. So I didn't know anybody in Staten Island. I didn't know anybody in Brooklyn. I thought, I'm not going over there because what are we going to do? That's what, you know, Jim was saying, we, let's follow them. I'm going, what are we going to do when we get over there? You know, let's not go over there. Let's go over to Joe and Diane's. You know, there's places we can go. I'm not going to, if we get over there, for what? Anyway, so then I insisted on going back to our apartment to get our belongings. I needed, I had packed an evacuation bag that I had run out with, and I also had um, just, I had, anyway, I wanted to go back for our stuff, and we headed back to our apartment. Four different sets of firemen stopped us and told us that we couldn't go forward, that we had to do, you know, get in line for one of the evacuation routes. But I was just so headstrong. I just said, I'm going back to get my stuff. I have got to get my stuff. You are not stopping me. And everybody was so dazed, they weren't going to, I mean, they would have had to like literally physically stop me because I was going back to get my stuff. I didn't have my cell phone, I didn't have my address book, I didn't have anything that was all in this bag that I was, so I had, I was going to go back and get it. Anyway, so ultimately we, uh, we made it back. We went back into our apartment and at this point it was maybe about an hour later and, um, just went over to the window and it was still hard to breathe. It was because there was there was a lot of that the way the the consistency of the dust it just hung in the air. It never really settled. It was just there. And so you're still breathing it in, breathing it in. But um, anyway, we picked up our stuff. Then we started our we had friends that lived about four blocks away and we uh, we, we were, we, anyway, we decided to see if they were still there. We didn't even know whether they would still be there if they had evacuated. We thought, okay, let's start there. It's four blocks away. Let's start with Joe and Diane. And I was walking um, across Liberty Park, which is right by Ground Zero, and the church bells started ringing. And that's one thing that I'll always remember. And, you could just feel the death in the air, and you could just hear the church bells ringing. The whole th that, so I'm thinking maybe it was noon at that time that those church bells were just automatic. I could be wrong; they could have been, but I'm you know I've always remembered. I, I can still hear the sounds of the church bells and the feeling of walking through death. And um, 
you know, we were stepping over beams and personal belongings, briefcases were everywhere, and um, just lucky to be alive. At that, you know, we got about four blocks away, and that was a, you know, there's a photograph of me that, you know, Jim said, let me take a photograph of you, so, you know, alive to tell about it. And we, we were still kind of surprised that we were even alive. But um, we made it over to our friends who thought we had died. They, you know, they were really just terrified. Then they didn't hear from us for a couple hours. You know, it's like we didn't come right over. They had us in the basement. So at this point, it was like about two hours since the tower had fallen. And so they were... Um, but anyway, so it was a very happy reunion. And we all just hung out all afternoon, eating grapes and popcorn, just watching it on TV, you know, just... And um, it, took a, the, the, it took a long time for me to appreciate how, what, what was really happening, because that afternoon I wanted to go and start cleaning up the apartment. I was saying things like, well, I don't want to just sit here and watch TV. I need to clean that place up. We need to, you know, I might as well do it today. I'm not, what am I doing today? Why am I just watching TV when I can be getting, getting back in my apartment? I was, I said, I'm going to, I want to go back and start cleaning up. I want to, and, you know, my friends were just going, uh, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think this is a day to do that. <laughs> you know? Just you know, anyway, so there was kind of. It took me a long time to really appreciate just how serious it was. But um, anyway, that's the immediate story. We uh, stayed with our friends until at 5:20 in the afternoon. Building seven also came down. It was uh, over a substation, a con. Edison substation, which was an electrical station. So when that tower fell, when that building fell down, um, all the power in all of lower Manhattan went out. At that point, we had no power. And we thought, what, you know, okay, time to go. This is ridiculous for us to stay here. So we, um, we walked up to a friend who had a huge loft in the meat packing district. I think it was maybe 29th Street, maybe 12th Avenue. And uh, he had a huge loft. And as it turns out, he had seven people staying there that were five of us. No, no, in fact, yeah, there were seven because... Um, Six of like our we we ours was the worst because our our windows had broken in. But other you know he knew two other people that lived down there and uh, like Joe and Diane. And then he had a friend from out of town from Chicago who couldn't get out of town at that point. He was stuck in town. So um, and he was our so anyway there were seven of us there, eight all together with Ira and just watching it and. You know, just watching it. So, but, uh, can you talk about how tough it was to get back to your apartment and the amount of, I, I guess, secrecy that. Well, we the amount um, of control. We ultimately, on we after we stayed with Ira a few days, and we went over to Pennsylvania, but they didn't let anybody back in for ten days because I kept calling, or you know, we really wanted to to see. You know, we were homeless. I didn't, you know, we had to go out and buy t a new toothbrush, you know, I mean, new clothes. We were, like, just trying to pick up, you know, clothes on our back. We really wanted to go back into our apartment, but it took 10 days before they let anybody back. And then they had very strict rules about going back. You had to have a police escort, which meant... There was no traffic, no cars, no taxis. The whole area was only foot traffic. So if you wanted to salvage anything, then it would be a matter, you're going to carry this. So I had a rolling suitcase, but you know, so I could try to put some of my stuff and roll it away. But um, they, you know, they had a police, es you had a police escort at all times. There was never a point you didn't have somebody watching you when you were in your apartment. 
And when we first went back in our apartment, the very first time, we realized that we had been looted. And because Jim had had a backpack, a leather backpack that had important papers in it, and all of those papers were just thrown around on the kitchen counter. And it's like, what are these papers doing on the kitchen counter? Well, they had taken the backpack because they had taken the computer. I'm sure whoever took the computer just put the computer in the backpack. And then we were, we were looted. They had gone through everything. In those 10 days, they had gone through everything. You could tell every drawer had been gone through, every everything. So we had, um, that was like the second, well, you know, it was just kind of one thing on top of another uh, with the looting. Because even then I was still very naive. A lot of people said, well, aren't you scared you're going to be looted? And I would go, oh, no, no, I, we're not going to be looted. They're, you know, that area is you know, protected, is cordoned off. That they, they, We're not going to be looted. Well, surprise, we were looted. And um, that was kind of tough. And then when we tried to report the looting, because Jim's insurance would cover a lot of our belongings, the police in our district, uh, three times we went to our precinct to file a report. They refused to take the report. The computer was down. The person was at lunch. I don't even know. All I know is that we made three trips in person to try to file that report so we could get the insurance to cover some of our things. Uh, then somebody told us, well, you don't have to go to your precinct because it was a we were staying up at Lincoln Center. It's actually a big deal for us to go down there to the precinct. So we went to another um, police station and we filed the report there, which listing all the different things. And they said, well, we'll fax this over to your precinct and then in a couple of days call them and they'll give you a report number. So we call in a couple of days to our precinct. No record of having received the report. No record at all call a few days later, no record of the report. So we went back to the precinct where we had filed the report and they also had no record of us having filed the report. So it became clear that there was a complete cover up of the looting and the police were not going to take any reports about the looting, no matter what. If it meant you needed the report number to get your insurance, too bad. No, complete cover-up. So I went through like a lot of different levels of seeing the underbelly of the world. I just never, you know, at that point I believed it was the, uh, the, the hijackers. So I thought I was seeing world, you know, like the evil of the world, but then it went down through the whole system with the looting. Who did the looting? and who covered the looting up. It was just, it was really a pretty disheartening and shocking uh, realization that the, the corruption was as deep as it really was. But, you know, we, I, I did go back. I went back about 16 times and I would always, uh, we would take our belongings over to our niece's studio in Brooklyn and she had a backyard. We would just like try to clean our belongings. Everything had been covered with dust. Every, the dust would just blow to the wind. But this one time uh, I didn't go back to the studio. I went back to the hotel and when I opened up the bag, my suitcase, and I started trying to clean the belongings and could really pour dust off. Well I ended up with a pile of dust which I had on a piece of like a newspaper and then I thought it was just really a fluke. I thought, geez, I should do a piece of art with this. I should do a memorial. I, these are human remains. I, I, you know, I just thought, I should, this is my memorial right here. I'm going to save this dust. And so I put it in a plastic bag. And then um, it was just something I brought back as, you know, for art, really, as an artist. I kind of see everything through an artist's eyes and how does this translate into art. So when I saw the dust, it translated into a piece of art for me. And um, as it turns out, the dust ends up 
to this day being part of my life. I would have never dreamed that one little bag of dust would follow me so far. But uh, ultimately, we decided when the anthrax attack started, which started a few weeks later, I had, uh, we were looking for another place to live. We were, we both wanted to stay in New York. I really didn't want to, I, I wanted to find another place and start living in, you know, where, where are we going to live? Well, I was getting a lot of pressure from family and friends in California to come back to California. Like, why are you staying there? My kids were going, when are you coming home? Why are you staying there? I don't understand why you're staying there. You need to come home. So I had a lot of pressure from my children and my friends to come home. And Jim's health was very bad. He started having really like heart problems. And anyway, but um, the main thing was the anth anthrax started. And then when all the anthrax attacks started, it was happening at Rockefeller Center and all over New York. I was really terrified that um, they were going to put it in the subways. And that was really the decision to leave New York because I couldn't even take the subway. I wasn't comfortable anywhere anymore. I, prior to that, I was still taking the subway around and then I didn't even want to get on the subway. It just became ultra paranoid about being on the subway. Then if you're not going to go on the subway, you can't really, for me, I mean, it makes New York pretty difficult to get around. So. Um, I just, I just came home. I have a home in Oakland, California, and I had, I had kept a home. I would kept an in-law apartment, and I just moved back into my in-law apartment and um, just started realizing how affected I was. You know, once I, in some ways, it was easier when I was in New York, when I was recovering my belongings because I was engaged and in survival, engaged in survival. So I didn't really, um, I just had, and every day was a list to do. There wasn't one day that I didn't have a list. This is what needs to be done today, whatever that was. And, um, but um, anyway, when I got back to Oakland, I live in a very serene place. It was very quiet and it really just started hitting me that, you know, life as I knew it was over. You know, my life had changed in a big way. I was no longer living with my boyfriend that I had been living with for 10 years. I was really quite, um, I'll say, psychologically damaged. I really had very serious post-traumatic stress where it would be uh, difficult for me to even get the mail. The thought of my mailbox is across the street, it was too far to go. It was really too far to go. I was really just kind of paralyzed. That Christmas I had some people over Christmas Eve and I, uh, I had a, a case of wine glasses in my storage area. It was too much to get them out of storage. And I had people who were just drinking wine out of cups because going, just opening up the door to the storage area and getting the wine glasses and carrying it out was really too much for me to do. I was, I really, it, I was so disconnected. I kind of had to really start over again, learning how to do things and even cooking. I remember it was like months and months later, maybe even six months, maybe even longer before I could really like cook. I like all the food would I would just go to the deli and buy prepared food because the idea of putting a meal together was too complicated. So it was it took me really a long time to really get back in the swing of things and not that I have ever completely gotten back into the swing of things. Um, it was just amazing, but I was fortunate because there was one thing that I always like to do, and I um, I study Japanese flower arranging ikebana. I loved being surrounded with flowers, and that was really my salvation. I 
continued taking classes a couple of days a week in the flower arranging. In order to do that, I would have to go down to the flower market. And that whole period of time, that was like the one thing I would do would be go to the flower market, lots of flowers. And I just, in many ways, wanted to just be left alone. I really couldn't, at that point, it was hard to really function socially. But I always said the flowers were my friends, and I would just be here surrounded with the flowers. And I actually got a lot of happiness out of that. I really enjoyed working with them, and I just thought, at least this, you know, I have this. And that, I th that was really the beginning of the healing of my spirit, I think, finding something, you know, having something that I truly liked, and plus it also calmed me. So my real um, road to recovery really had to do a lot with uh, artistic expression, and that artistic spirit, the creative spirit, was, I believe, the spark that helped bring me back to life, just the creative spark. Um, and one of the other things I did, there were a couple of other things, uh, I was only interested in putting my book together. I realized, uh, I, when I, I didn't really see the photographs I had until I came back to California because we had our camera, fortunately, when we went back and, you know, uh, rescued our things, we got our camera, but our computer had been stolen, so I wasn't able to really look at our disk with all the photographs on it until I came back to California because I had a, a computer here. But when I saw the photographs I had, I have photographs of the World Trade Center before 9-11, during 9-11, after 9-11. It was just such a historical account that I had in photographs. I started working on putting a book together. And the five weeks I was in New York staying in the hotel, I also um, was keeping a diary. So ultimately, I really went to my diary and used the words that I had as I was going through it. Every day I would write something about what I had done that day and what was, you know, how it, what we were doing. And so when I got back here, I had my photographs, I had my diary, I ended up uh, writing a book, combining uh, my art, my photographs, calling it Fortunate, a personal diary of 9-11, where I pretty much uh, give the account that I'm giving you. Maybe, you know, there's more details here and there, but pretty much the account I'm giving you. And uh, I documented that in my book. But I still wasn't able to really get back into the social swing of things. I really didn't fit into society anymore. Uh, I was on a different page than anybody else in California. Californians had experienced it in a whole other way, and they, you know, I just felt like just alone. It was a very lonely period. I was never, my, I had been living with my friend Jim for 10 years. That ended. So even though I didn't technically lose a loved one, the relationship I had with him ended in the way I had known it and the life we had had. So you know, it was a lot. I was traumatized, my relation, you know, it, it was just a lot of different things. But I, I was just haunted by why this had happened. I had never been politically aware at all. I really didn't know anything about our foreign policy. I didn't even want to know. It's like, don't tell me. And, um, but in order to understand this, I realized I had to educate myself to just put the pieces of the puzzle together. I joined the Commonwealth Club um, in San Francisco. And, to, and the Commonwealth Club is a speaking organization that's over 100 years old. And they host almost every important person in the entire world speaks at the Commonwealth Club at one point or another. And there's, constant commentary and speakers that write books. So um, I still didn't want to socialize. The only thing I really wanted to do, other than write my book, 
was to go over to the Commonwealth Club. And I, uh, we have a BART system, which is a subway system, and the door opens right in front of the Commonwealth Club. So it was very easy for me to take BART over. Just, and it was something I could do alone, because I really wanted, I, did, I really couldn't be with other people. I really needed to be alone. And going and listening to the lectures was, um, it was easy for me to do alone and just take BART over and do that. So I spent actually quite a bit of time going to lectures and then the more I learned about our foreign policy, the more I started, I guess I, my starting point is everybody was saying it was blowback. My question is blowback for what? So I started reading books and hearing speakers and um, just I guess just learning more of the things that I finally needed to, to understand. And um, this whole time in the background, the commission is finally formed. The commission is hearing witnesses. And um, when the commission report was released, the Commonwealth Club hosted two of the commissioners at the Fairmont in San Francisco. and. Uh, I went by myself. I just thought, I'm, you know, I really want to go see them. I even bought for $75 extra a premium seat. I sat in the second row right behind Willie Brown because I wanted to be, I was like, really wanted to hear every word. I really wanted them to make it okay because it wasn't okay in my mind. I wanted these two men to make this okay for me. And they didn't make it okay for me. I came out with more questions than I could even imagine because the, they spoke for a half an hour. The first words out of their mouth, they said, we, want, we're, we decided early on we weren't going to be pointing fingers because it would just be a can of worms. We were going to concentrate on preventing future attacks. We didn't want to open up a can of worms. I thought, can of worms, no pointing fingers, where is the accountability? Somebody must have done something. There must have been somebody along the line that there was like, where is the misfunction? And who did it? And you, how did it happen? So it can't, how can you stop it if you don't know what happened? You know, what needs to be fixed? You, you know, there was, so there, they just, it was, their half hour was just spin, 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 not really saying anything in terms of what I needed to hear and coming to grips with putting the puzzle pieces together so I could live in peace, so I could have peace. And um, then in the question and answer period, the, the commentator, who uh, the moderator, said he had never had so many questions. He, because everybody would have a question. It was a huge ballroom, you know, big, huge ballroom filled with people, like questions galore, and um, a lot of the questions had to do with things that are we're, st we're still questioning today. They had to do with questions about our air defense. They had to do with questions about put options. They had to do with questions about a lot of things that people really wanted to know. Why, you know, what did happen to the air defense? They did not answer even one question. Every single answer was, well, we'd, you know, we'd like to answer that question, but we can't because the information is classified. Well, this is another area of classified information. This is another area of classified information. Well, as it turns out, everything was classified. So why even stand up here and call a question and answer? Don't eat, you know, just say we're not answering anything. We're not going to tell you anything. Don't even act like we can have the power to have a question. Just, you know, I was just fuming. I really was. I, I was just confused because the outcome was completely different than I expected. I expected to go over there and feel good about the commissioners. I, and the outcome was completely different. I was not in a very good space. I was so angry that they were not solving my distress. They actually were adding distress because I had more questions than ever. I thought, 
Why is everything secret? I mean, are we really living in a society where our government is like completely, everything they do is secret? You know, just it just really confused me as to all the secrecy. And um, I, um, I, there were some people outside of, um, that had literature about alternative things that happened. So I thought, well, they're not telling us what happened. What, what does this other literature say? You know, I might as well look at this because they're not giving us anything to look at here. And that was really when I started becoming aware of people like Dr. David Ray Griffin, who has been a researcher, and his book, The New Pearl Harbor, that was really the first book that started outlining uh, and giving a clearer picture of some of the possible answers to questions regarding the air defense. So it was, um, it was really quite a turning point the day that I heard the commissioners. And that's why I sometimes say that I have them to thank for my awareness and my education of learning more about how our system works and realizing that as citizens we have to become informed. Um, they inspired me to learn more. They, and the funny thing was um, I saw one of them in New York at an event at one point at NYU on one of the anniversaries. As survivors, we were also involved in support groups, and so there were all kinds of activities, especially at the fifth anniversary. So uh, I was in a survivors group that it, there was an event at NYU, and um, Thomas Keene was there, and I wanted to talk to him. I did go up and talk to him about my dismay of the uh, the commission report and really not knowing, like, why won't you answer these questions? Well, he basically, again, did not answer anything, but it suggested if I didn't like the system, then I should do something about it myself. Then you need to get involved in politics. You know, you need to get it more involved. You're not an involved citizen. You know, if you don't like the way we're doing it, kind of do it yourself. And I just said, well, as a matter of fact, I am. That is exactly what I'm going to do, and that's very good advice. And you know, you know, that's you're right. We all need to do it ourselves because you know. Anyway, it was just kind of they always were so smug. The commissioners, uh, they did not give us a complete report, but they were still proud of themselves. I think it was their smugness that irritated me the most that. They could be so sure of themselves and so proud of themselves. Proud for what? You know, you're not telling us anything. I don't know. It's just the so. And to this day, um, I think that's one of the strongest points that I really like to tell people about is um, we really don't know what happened. There are a lot of theories about it, and a lot of people. There's a, it's a lot of information that you can research about, but the one thing that everybody agrees upon is that there was a cover-up. And I think that is the point when, um, when you're introducing people to information, that's the first thing they have to realize is that there is a cover-up and um, that it was not an impartial commission by any means. And um, when you really do the research, you can see like all, uh, all the unanswered questions. David Ray Griffin, um, his, one of his books, the 9-11 Commission Report, Omissions and Distortions, lists 115 discrepancies. Well, what does that tell you? Anyway, so all along, and I've been an advocate of new investigation. I'm just hoping that um, that will be able to, that the people in the U United States, the mainstream, will realize this is something that has to be 
addressed the unanswered questions of 9-11 has cast a shadow of doubt as a black cloud of doubt over America in the minds of Americans, in the minds of people overseas. And until we get address the fact that we need to address this, people are just waking up to uh, accepting that we need to address it. And I'm happy to see all the progress that's been made over the last seven and a half years in terms of opening up people's minds and I think we're at a um, we're at an interesting point that uh, in terms of information coming out um, and I I'm scared for our future and I'm scared for many reasons having watched this unfold I realize um, that the people that are doing this will stop at nothing. They will, abs you know, absolutely anything can happen next. And we're just having to, uh, it's caused so much insecurity in our country. That uh, the thing that I resent the most about what happened on 9 11 was the psychological, that it was a deliberate psychological manipulation of our minds in a very negative way and I really suffered a lot um, emotionally mentally I've had a lot of mental anguish over this and when I realized this was done purposely that it was some people sat in a room and mapped this out specifically to get into the minds of everybody and manipulate it introduce fear, absolute fear, just the triggering of, um, you know, just what they introduced into our minds. That um, People need to realize that um, there were obvious casualties, the people that died, the people that were injured, the rescue and um, the the, re the rescue people, they were injured, but what they don't realize is that every single person was injured. This is about everybody, every single person, because we were all exposed by way of television to the psychological operation designed to terrorize us, designed to plant that feeling of fear so far in us that you're never gonna lose it. Just that, so um, it affected everybody. It was directed at everybody. It wasn't just directed at the people in the World Trade Center or in the Pentagon. This was meant for everybody. And I don't think people realize just how much of a direct victim they were. And as I've watched this unfold, we've become more and more affected. And um, what we've had to witness, the wars that have come out of this, the economic problems that have come out of this, the daily harassment, the surveillance. Uh, traveling has become a complete nightmare, adding so much time with all the security checks. Uh, you know, taking away our, the smallest thing, like a bottle of perfume, you know, just the, just, it's just, gone so deep into our daily lives that we are all, it's not an accident that's planned. So we are all planned victims. And um, so when I think of the casualties of 9-11, I look at all of us as casualties. Some of us were more directly involved than others, but um, it's about all of us. That's why now, you know, it was about all of us then, it's still about all of us. So I'm praying for unity of people in this country to come together and unify because there are a lot of us. And if everybody would come together and unify, we could hopefully take back our republic, that something could be done if we can just do something about the apathy that is rampant 
um, for whatever reason, people do not want to take the time. They don't want to take the emotional strain that it takes to accept the information. I mean, it's very emotionally draining to even uncover the information. Who really wants to do that? People don't want to do it. Americans don't want to do it. They want to be mesmerized by the television. They want to be entertaining themselves. And um, anyway, <clears throat> that's it. Oh, that was great. Um, um, there was one thing I wanted you to just uh, re-say real quickly. Um, back when you had all your belongings in your friend's backyard and you had the dust, if you can um, just real quick give that one, because you, you, know, you used uh, that as a transition to just Stephen. If I could just get that little bit from you again, just right. real quick describing how you had the dust and how you just decided to save right. it and ended up becoming. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah, if I could just get yeah. that from you again. Yeah, okay. Um, when I would rescue my belongings, I would have to wait in line for police escort we would go back into the apartment, have to climb up dark stairs. I had a rolling suitcase. We had to carry everything. I would throw air, just not throw, I would like try to pack as many things as quickly as I could because you only had a couple of minutes. They only let you in there for a couple of minutes. Pack everything up. Well, with everything covered with dust, we were staying, uh, Jim's niece, and we were staying at a hotel, but Jim's niece, had, he had, she had a studio in uh, Brooklyn, and it was large enough, she had a backyard, so it was kind of the perfect place, our staging area to clean our things. So we would always go over there and um, like, just try to wash things, try to, but there is no washing them because the dust had such a consistency. It just stayed, the feel of it just stayed. But nevertheless, I would try to, you know, clean it up as much as we could. And um, one day, uh, we, for some reason, I was doing something else. I didn't really have time to go to the studio. I had to end up taking all the things back to the hotel where we were staying. And I tried, I started trying to clean them there. And I... Uh, as I unpacked things, you could literally pour dust. There was just like debris. I shouldn't just say dust. It was also debris. Just so I ended up with a pile. I uh, on the on on a piece of paper I had. I was collecting everything, and it was I was going to throw it away. I just didn't want it to get on the hotel. I just wanted to keep it contained. And then, as an artist and um, I was, I, I was very sensitive to the fact that there were human remains in the dust, that this dust was sacred, and as a memorial I decided to uh, save some of the dust, and um, in some ways it reflected you know, the destruction in my life. I did an art piece about it that was called All That Remains, and it's just, um, I had a a glass container filled with dust that was somewhat like a urn. I felt it was like a resting place for the ashes. And um, when I put my, I had a, uh, I had a ec art exhibition at the six month anniversary. I did a memorial exhibition called There But For The Grace Of God at a friend's gallery in San Francisco. And, um, I, that piece was in the exhibition. I had seven pieces of art in the exhibition. And then when I put my book together, uh, the fortunate book, I included the seven photographs. And, um, and I, uh, I self-published my book and it's pretty much been a gift to friends and I've kind of a calling card just so people can I, help them understand to know me, understand why I'm so affected, this is what happened. It's also a historical document. As it turns out, um, a lot of people saw and were uh, interested in one particular piece of art and that was the ashes. And as um, research was starting in all different areas of 
the 9-11 things. Many people were wanting to investigate whether the collapses were actually controlled demolitions. As many people thought on the very day, even the news commentators thought they were controlled demolitions. So there was a lot of controversy about whether they were or not. And uh, friends of mine that knew that I had the dust were also um, knew a scientist, uh, Stephen Jones in, um, at BYU, who was interested in studying and zeroing in on this subject. They contacted me and asked me if I would be willing to have my dust analyzed. And um, I guess in some ways I thought that was going to be another question it would put to rest. I thought, they're not going to find anything in my dust. You know, this is ridiculous, this little amount of dust. How could those explosives end up in my dust? And I, um, I was willing to be part of the investigation uh, because I really thought it was going to actually answer, like I said, it was going to answer the question or we'll, you know, put it to rest. But as it turns out, it was another situation where it only open the door to more questions and to more research. And um, I initially had given Dr. Jones a small sample. Ultimately, he came out to California and with, met with me and other people in my home. And we just like examined all the dust. He took um, things that he thought looked interesting or would be the best to analyze and um, in the meantime uh, I'm finding out just recently that there were nanothermite uh, thermite in the dust which is high-grade explosives and uh, I guess they're calling them red chips and uh, that you know what were those red chips doing in the dust they're unexploded explosives they can still be exploded. And um, even though I was the first person to come forward with a dust, since that time, there have been other um, people coming forward. There have been other samples. And as it turns out, all the samples have the exact same fingerprint. They all have this red. Uh... Anyway, they, just, yeah. I gotcha. they all have it. So, Any closing statements? Uh, I pray for unity, that Americans can have the courage to stand up and do what we need to do in order to solve these problems. It's going to take every one of us to be unified, and, and I believe we can do it. We were raised as Americans to believe that we had the wear of for all and that we were about freedom and justice. and. I just hope those things that have been ingrained in us will uh, carry forth. Um, and I, I want to say something about Michelle Little. Michelle wanted me to say something about her, so I'm sure. trying to like figure out how to like figure this in about all the different things that people have been healing. There have been a lot of healing uh, projects. I tried to heal through my art, through my flowers, and I have a good friend, Michelle Little, who has um, started an organization called Unite in Peace, but she has a pinwheel project where she has children in schools making pinwheels that are now going to be peace offerings to children. I'm not sure. Where are they? Children? All over the world. All over the world. And it's just inspiring to see that, you know, with um, Michelle's brother, uh, David Weiss, was a firefighter and who was killed. And so it's, it's inspiring to see in people's grief that they can find the strength to try to find a positive, uh, you know, something positive, not just for their own healing, but for the healing of the entire world. And, uh, Michelle Little is really quite inspiring in that way, just understanding that we have to have peace within ourselves and peace with each other 
And that's another thing I believe that we should all be working on is just finding that peace with ourselves and connecting with the world and peace for all of us. That's what we all need. So I've met some extraordinary people along my way and you know I could name several you know more I could go on but uh, I feel fortunate to have met a lot of the people that have come into my life. I finally am, uh, I've crossed a threshold after seven years and seven months where I can finally say I'm a better person for having gone through all of this. It's taken me this long because I was so compromised um, psychologically that I, uh, I always like mourned the person I lost because I've never been that person again. I was so altered. But now that I've come through it, I see the light at the end of the tunnel for me personally and um, I'm a better person. I'm a better person for knowing about my country. I'm a better person for taking the time. I'm a better person for having the strength of character to speak out, recognizing the importance and recognizing that I can have a valuable role in this. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect timing. <laughs> Cut. <laughs>